Good morning and welcome to the Green Mountain Care Board. My name is Kevin Mullen, Chair of the Board. And we're going to start off the meeting today with our Executive Director's Report, Susan Barrett. Great, thank you, Chair. I have um, some announcements and uh, to start off uh, some changes to the agenda uh, for this morning and this afternoon. So for this morning, we are taking off of the agenda the update on COVID relief funds. Um, we have rescheduled that to the beginning of next week, likely September 14th. So please keep an eye on our uh, website and our press release for the changes in Secretary Smith coming to report um, on those COVID relief funds and the updates. In addition, uh, this afternoon, we will be hearing um, an update and it will have a discussion on the primary care program for um, the One Care Vermont. And uh, we've invited folks from One Care as well as Health First and others to testify and discuss this with you this afternoon. And that starts at 1 p.m. today. And Mike, I don't know if there's anything else I need to do for the agenda, let me know, but I, I think we've covered it. No, nope, I think you covered it. Great, thank you. And that's all I have to report. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Susan. So today we're going to um, turn it over to our hospital budget team to walk us through um, the rest of the hospitals that we did not go through last week. And before we do that, I just want to um, say that because of Susan's announcement uh, earlier that Secretary Smith will not be here this afternoon, it brings up a question about um, whether um, we should be utilizing Act 91 to um, create an extension. Likely it would just be needed for a couple of days, maybe a little bit longer than that. Um, but that would be um, up to the board to decide in a, in a vote. And um, at any point, any board member could make a motion to um, change that September 15th deadline if they so chose. Um, as for myself, I would really like to hear from Secretary Smith before we make any final decisions on any hospital budgets. But again, that will be um, up to the board to decide and um, we will go from there. Um, Sonny, are you hearing everything that we're saying okay and everything good? Yes, good morning. I can hear you just fine. Thank you. Um, I just want to clarify that um, when you do not need me to record any part of this proceeding, just please let me know if, if you are going to have someone come in later. Thank you. So at uh, we will not need you this afternoon. We will not need you at the one o'clock. Okay, That's, very good. Although it's somewhat related, it's unrelated to the hospital budget process. Sure, sure. All right, so, thank you. Okay. Um, with that, I'm going to turn it over to Patrick Rooney and his team to begin to um, walk us through um, the rest of their analysis on the other Vermont hospitals. So Patrick, are you ready? We are ready. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Good morning, board members. Um, at first, I'm going to apologize. I will not be on screen today. Ever since the wind swept through our region on Sunday, my allergies have gone into hyperdrive and I look like a Claritin commercial with a inflated head and, and a faucet for a nose. So I'm gonna spare you all having to look at that for the next couple of hours. Um, <clears throat> however, I do seem to have my voice, so I will continue to um, chat away and Lori will um, hop in intermittently on a few of the other hospitals as well. But before we start, we're gonna give you a couple updates on some of the changes to the slide deck that we presented last week. They are relatively minor in nature. Uh, <clears throat> on slide seven, we changed the title here and added the caveat at the bottom. Uh, we changed it to approved overall change in charge, five-year average, and we noted that this does not include um, the UVM Health Network's uh, I'm sorry, commercial. Mr. Rooney. Uh, Mr. Yes. Rooney? Um, hi, yes. this is Annie, the core reporter. Uh, uh, if you wouldn't mind just slowing down a little and um, maybe getting a little closer to your microphone, that would be really helpful, thanks. Um, Certainly. The last, the last thing you said, Approved overall change change in charge five year average and yes and we included the caveat note at the bottom that this does not include the UVM Health Network's commercial effective rate that is an update from last week I will navigate to <clears throat> 
slide 20, we did receive some updates to uh, planned ACO participation. These are ongoing and we will continue to update this throughout the deliberative process. As we mentioned, we would uh, last week. <clears throat> we added for uh, our board the uh, CRF funding application information that we have received uh, to date, and this actually came to our July 2020 year to date monthly submissions uh, from the hospitals. And so we have shown here up on the screen those hospitals which have applied. Some hospitals, mostly the network and Rutland Regional, have given us numbers of funds they hope to attain through the state CARES Act funding that uh, Executive Director Barrett and uh, Board Chair Mullen mentioned earlier uh, in this. Uh, meeting here. Uh, most of the hospitals do not have a figure that they could apply for or supply for us. So <clears throat> we did note um, whether or not they intended to apply or not in this first round of funding that the state has opened up for providers in the state of Vermont. Um, and lastly, <clears throat> on slide 27, uh, Board Chair Mullen last week um, requested that we add to this um, the uh, request the data and other information in a timely and accurate manner to standard budget order conditions. Uh, as we discussed at last Wednesday's meeting, there is probably not going to be any time in the future in which we do not seek monthly financial information from the hospitals. And <clears throat> with everything that is up in the air this year, timely, timely and accurate monthly reporting is more important uh, in the coming year than it has been <clears throat> in years past. So we have added that to standard budget order conditions that will be in every hospital's budget order. Uh, once these deliberations and votes conclude. With that, I'm going to navigate down to where we left off last Wednesday, and that is on <clears throat> Copley Hospital. And I will turn it over to Lori Perry to discuss the Copley Hospital. Good morning. Um, uh, as we're navigating to that particular slide, um, we wanted to mention that we have all of our submissions and we've made sure that the slide deck has any revisions updated um, to all of the hospitals, but we will continue to keep the board updated if we see anything new coming in. So Copley Hospital um, had a budget request that was 6.1% higher than their 20 budget. And this is 14% uh, higher than their 20 projection. The hospital is asking for an 8% change in charge, which is made up of 3.5 million commercial and 1.8 million, 1.9 million Medicare. Their justification was that um, they're also using a new accounting firm that will offer them process improvements. Their volume was expected to decrease because of COVID and they're expecting to see those volumes return pre-COVID. Um, they uh, need a reasonable margin to rebuild their cash reserves and their pair mix is shifting due to their population aging and then because of COVID. They have a master facility plan in 2021 and that is cost effective, integrated and efficient in capital outlays. And we've heard from other hospitals that they're trying to be very cautious with any capital plans going forward. And most of them are mainly doing replacements at this time, but this hospital is getting a plan together for 2021. Um, Copley's operating performance for last year was doing pretty good, like they said, the beginning of um, pre-COVID. And then like all the other hospitals, it started to reduce every quarter because of COVID. And then in quarter four, they made progress at a 17.8% quarterly NPR growth. Their operating margin also grew that last quarter at 17.2%. Um, we are encouraged by this hospital that they are, they are struggling, but they are um, trying to keep an eye on their costs while not getting the volumes that they usually would have seen pre-COVID. 
Copley, uh, we like to look at the hot, the different, all the hospitals um, operating performance back to 2015. So this slide is showing their NPR FPP uh, related to their budget and what they actually came in at for that particular year. So um, we also noticed that they were doing pretty good as of 2018. And then, um, excuse me, they, it was below budget, excuse me. Um, but they're trying to get a $77,000 budget for 21. And um, they're also, their operating margin has been up and down, as you've been seeing see with this slide. And they were at um, $2.2 million decreases for 18 and 19. And they're trying to build their operating margins, as they said, for their justification for this budget. Copley's change in charge, as mentioned, they're asking for an 8% change in charge. And um, they're going to be using this for um, all of their service categories. They're increasing them 8.8%. .8%. And then, as mentioned in the previous slide, they're asking for 3.5 million for commercial and 1.9 million for Medicare. The change in charge, though, is well over 100% of their request budget. Their change from 20 to 21 budget is 4,400, but their change in charge is 5,400. So it's 122% of their request. And on average, this hospital has been approved at 0.6% on a five year average. Last year, they were approved at a 9.8% change in charge. Next slide, please. And, and Copley's payer mix has been um, relatively stable. They were at, for commercial, they were at 60% of their NPR FPP in 2019, and they're budgeting at 57%. Their Medicare, it was at 31% in, fiscal year 19 and they're budgeting 33%. So it hasn't changed drastically. The only one mainly probably would have been the commercial self-pay and other payer. Their net patient revenue as a percent of gross revenue has declined since 2019. They were at 59% and now they're at 54%. So staff recommends that the 6.1% request for NPR be reduced by what we are going to be recommending for their change in charge. So they were asking for an 8% and staff is recommending that it should be 6.5%. And basically that's because we feel that they didn't get a chance to really use or um, they did use, but the volumes did not support the 9.8% change in charge that they received last year. So they weren't able to see those results flow through to their operating margins. Also, this hospital, as of February 2020, was operating at 3% above budget. So we thought that was pretty encouraging. Um, they said that they were exploring opportunities for cost control and opportunities to, for gains and integration. But, and their staff, we would like to see these opportunities to be further um, allowed to be um, come to fruition in the coming years, mainly give them an opportunity to fulfill those particular management and process improvements. Um, we also feel that because of the new leadership, the CEO and the CFO, that we should be able to um, see how they can improve this hospital's growth and basically just give them a chance to, um, like I just mentioned, process improvement and um, see how things go in this next year. The NPR growth of reducing the change in charge is six um, to six point five percent would be to reduce the NPR to four point seven percent. If the change in tar charge reduces to six percent, it would reduce NPR growth to four point two percent. So this is what our staff recommendation is: is to change the change in charge from eight percent to six point five percent. Lori, I have one question. 
Yes. My notes uh, talk a, bit, a little bit about a PPP grant that uh, they were carrying as a loan and assuming that they would have to repay it. Um, is, uh, is that something that we should keep in mind? Um, or do we know anything more about it? It's, it was a $5 million PPP grant, and um, it's currently considered a loan that they'll have to pay back. But I, I guess if, if the hospital performs in, in certain ways, they can keep that money. I would have to research that, Tom, and get back to you. Great. Thank you. Okay, moving to Rutland Regional Medical Center. <clears throat> uh, Rutland's NPR FPP uh, budgeted 2021 revenues are coming in at 7.6% uh, under the FY20 budget. They are budgeting down, and their change in charge this year is being requested at 6%. Um, the hospital's justifications, <clears throat> as noted on the slide in front of you on slide 70, um, they made uh, material changes of 12.7 million in cost reductions. They had a negotiation with their union to postpone salary increases in the uh, during this time of uh, uncertainty. Um, the the pension is currently appropriately funded, as CFO Judy Fox noted, uh, and they are opting not to contribute uh, two million dollars to the pension this year. <clears throat> They are uh, forecasting a ADC or average daily census of uh, 82 for their budget. They are currently at 77 now. Um, it did sound like there was some uncertainty around whether or not they would be able to get to 82, but that was one of their justifications for their uh, their current budget. Uh, they are assuming inpatient volume around 88 to 90 percent and outpatient volume around 100 <clears> percent of the 2020 budget or for an average of 95%. Historically, their five-year uh, change in charge is relatively low on the hospital spectrum. Um, there are certain items here that are unknown, as there are with many hospitals, and that would be FEMA grant funding, state CARES Act money, and other financial relief or forgiveness of loans. And <clears throat> the hospital itself uh, follows similar trends to other hospitals in the state. Um, they were um, experiencing issues moving into the second quarter and in the third quarter as COVID uh, descended upon our system and have uh, plugged along since then. <clears throat> and this hospital, as you can see, with its 2021 budget on slide 72, is budgeting around $247 million in NPR FPP. And that is on a similar plane as it was in 2016. And if you note below that, on slide 72, they produced almost an $11 million profit in 2016, and then it descended to 4.1 in 2017. The hospital came in with a negative 5.1% change in charge to offset that increase. And since that time, they've produced um, operating margins around a half a percent, uh, which is not substantial. It is consistent. It's probably not where they want to be, but with their reduction in revenues for this year, they are operating with a larger cost structure than they were back in 2016, and they're forecasting only a 0.6% operating margin, but that is consistent with prior years. Breakdown of their change in charge. Again, the overall change in charge request is at 6%. <clears throat> uh, that will contribute about $8.3 million to their NPR. The value of that is 1% of that is about $1.4 million. Uh, they will disperse those charges across inpatient and outpatient um, gross charges at 2.3 and 3.7 percent respectively and the um, due to the uh, the reduction of NPR of almost 20 million dollars the change in charge uh, contributes only a portion of revenue back to that and as you can see at the bottom their five-year average change in charge is 1.8 percent which includes that negative 5.1 that the hospital came in with and was approved for in fiscal 17 following the $11 million operating gain that they incurred in uh, FY16. Their payer mix <clears throat> from the commercial side remains relatively stable uh, and there seems to be an erosion being reported on the Medicare side, although slight and an increase in the Medicaid portion. Additionally, <clears throat> as Laura discussed with Copley, we're seeing a reduction in NPR as a percentage of gross revenues from uh, 2019 actual 45%, there was a, a budgeted spike to 46% in 2020, but it's now coming down to a budgeted 
um, figure of 43% of gross revenues. So the negative 7.6% request <clears throat> budget to budget um, certainly falls within the 3.5% uh, growth ceiling set forth by the board. We would recommend we approve that as submitted. And the change in charge, we would also recommend that we approve as submitted. It is uh, a little bit higher. However, <clears throat> um, the hospital was operating about 4% below budget. So they are budgeting down uh, moving forward as far as NPR goes. Um, they believe that some of the changes that are being made to their operations as it relates to COVID are certainly going to have an impact on their overall operations. Um, <clears throat> They do have a history of strong budget management. Even with the historically low change in charges, they've maintained a consistent operating margin, as I noted earlier. Um, and they've successfully managed those low change in charges. They continue to produce a margin. And therefore, although they are sometimes considered a higher cost hospital, they haven't pushed those charges off to the commercial payer year after year after year. And they've managed uh, within that structure that they've created for themselves. So uh, this request does support an operating margin consistent with past years, and we do believe that it is time that uh, the hospital itself be allowed to raise its charges and to get it back into more of the median with its um, fellow Vermont hospitals. So as noted with a motion language below, we would approve the reduction in the MPR as set forth in the budget and the change in charge as set forth in the budget. Lori, moving to provider transfers and accounting adjustment request hospitals. Well, do we want to talk about any comments on that one? I'm not sure how Kevin wants to proceed. So uh, originally I was going to proceed with questions at the end, but after uh, Tom jumping in on the last one, I do think that uh, it's a lot easier to focus them as we're just going through the slide. So Maureen, I would proceed with your question. Okay, um, just, just a couple comments first. Um, you know, one of the things, um, you know, I know I appreciate about the process and, uh, you know, I think we need to remind people, you know, in the public, this is the first time we're seeing this pr presentation as well. And, you know, we don't, um, we don't talk about this as a board or talk, you know, we haven't talked to the staff about what they're putting for recommendations. So I really appreciate all the recommendations you guys are putting forward. You know, I just want to, um, you know, let, put that out there that, you know, it's not like we've seen this and we've, we've all, you know, kind of, agreed with this and you know one of the things on rutland i do think or for me that i'm really going to keep in mind is they are the only hospital that is showing an npr that's lower than 2019 actuals and that's after their rate increase that they had in 2020 as well as this rate increase of six percent in in 2021 um they may be right. I mean, it could be that the the volume doesn't come back and that they may be the ones that are correct on the assumptions they're putting in and other hospitals maybe are assuming too much is coming back, but um, you know, only time it will tell. On this one in particular, I think for me, the 6% rate could be bifurcated to have some being as COVID. And the reason I would put that forward is because they are showing a quite a top line drop off year over year. Um, they did state that it was related to volume not coming back, you know, due to partially due to COVID. Um, and, um, you know, if if in fact they're right and we separated part as a COVID adjustment, then as we move into 2022, we could say, you know, it, that wasn't a temporary reduction or temporary uh, commercial rate increase. If in fact they actually see more people coming back and their NPR is higher and it, it also drops to the bottom line, there may not be a need to keep a 6% increase year over year. So I, I'm just going to put that out for, for this one in particular because I do see it as different than the other hospital requests. Um, I agree it falls you know, under any of the caps, but um, that also doesn't necessarily mean that you know, a, a, what I would consider a relatively high commercial increase you know, should carry. Um, I also would say they did put a lot of discipline and hard work into their expense management, and they are one of the 
only hospitals that is also lower for expenses in 2019 from 2019 as well. So, I mean, they are trying to pair this with expense management, but, um, you know, and then one of the other metrics that we have looked at, which is your um, charges relative to Medicaid and Medicare, the commercial charges relative to that, they're on the higher side. So I wouldn't say that they charge low prices in commercial for the services, especially when you compare it to how that compares to Medicaid and Medicare. So those are some of the things that I'm thinking about as I look at this one. And and just to put that out there, so when we will be talking about um, decisions, you know, this one certainly um, I would want to bifurcate the commercial rate. You know, whether whether we would whether I would agree to approve the whole thing and it's three and three or something like that. But but I am definitely thinking about that on this one. Um, thanks. So I would just uh, chime in um, that this is a hospital that. Um, made a decision late to um, become more actively involved in the all-payer model. And um, they did not come back and ask for any additional um, dollars to be allocated for reserves for um, the risk of taking on the Medicare population. So uh, I just want to uh, put that out there as well, Maureen. Lori, Brattleboro. Sure. Uh, we separated out the hospitals that had provider transfers or enhancements and any accounting adjustments, and Brattleboro was the first one. And this hospital is requesting a 5.3% uh, growth rate between their 20 budget and their 21 request. They're also asking for 18.6% increase from their 20 projection to their 21 budget. This hospital is requesting a COVID change in charge of 2% and a 2.9% change in charge for their standard overall. Um, the standard is asking for 1.3 million commercial and the COVID is asking for almost $900,000 in commercial. So this is a total change in charge of 4.9%. The hospital's justification was um, the growth, gross revenue is 95% of their fiscal year 20 budget and this is called their new normal. The 21 budget assumes they will maintain this 95% of old information as the new normal. And the 2% COVID portion of the rate is to co cover their COVID expenses, which includes 15 FTE screeners. They are the fourth busiest hospital in terms of the emergency department treating mental health and psychiatric patients. And they're in collabor collaboration with Dartmouth and Cheshire on some of their services. And I believe they said uh, definitely cardiology. Next slide, please. So um, we have the accounting and provider transfers in this slide broken out so that you see, they said that the pediatrics, just so pediatrics that they had had in their 20 budget was portion of that was moving to private practice from the hospital. And that equated to almost 900 or $833,000 less in their 20 budget. They also were making an accounting adjustment for their ACO dues, which were included in their contractor allowances. And now it's gonna be included in their operating expenses per our instructions. And that was equal to $427,000 and the effect of NPR percentage growth. So reducing their 20 budget by the $800,000 for provider transfers equal to 1% growth, NPR to NPR, but the accounting adjustment makes that a minus 0.5% adjustment to NPR. Slide 78, uh, 79, excuse me. So this is just talking about the provider transfer again. This was just so pediatrics showing what their NPR reduction is, their expenses. But because their expenses were higher than their NPR, it's actually giving them a profit. Um, and this particular transfer was effective July 31st, 2020. Next slide, please. And again, this is the more detail on the provider transfer request for this just so pediatrics. Um, the 
uh, they just consolidated this pediatric into the Brattleboro primary care. And so that's why, and it didn't happen the full year, so it's partial. So this looks like it's basically two months worth of um, NPR and expenses. This included a partial provider FTE. They had eight non-provider FTEs. And then this in effect is a 1% impact on the NPR FPP uh, for co comparing 20 to 21 budget growth. And we recommend that the board acknowledge this particular provider transfer. Are there other uh, provider transfers that are going to be coming up, or is this the only one that we have this year? There is Brattleboro, Mount Scutney has basically, we're calling them enhancements. And then we have um, Northwestern is showing the providers that were in their 20 budget, they no longer were present for their 21 budget. And then also they have uh, service enhancements also, and um, Northwestern has accounting adjustment. Okay, I see that you were used the the term acknowledgement. I thought that uh, we had to approve these changes to the uh, NPR FPP through the provider transfers. What what is the appropriate language when we do make that motion? We will be giving that to you. That we will asking you to acknowledge these transfers. Okay, great, thank you. And at the moment, um, if the motion on the particular slides don't quite say that, we will be adjusting the motion language through all the slides when you're ready to vote. So we'll be giving you that slide deck updated with that information. Super, thank you. Mm -hmm. So Brattleboro Memorial Hospital's performance for 2020, they were doing uh, pretty good compared to what was happening in the latter half of the year. Um, this particular hospital was 0.5% over their budget as of February 2020. Um, their operating margin, they were doing very well, well, at least breaking even in quarter one, lost quite a bit of money in quarter two, started to see gains in quarter three because of COVID relief funds. And then <laughs> Bless you. And then um, $3.9 million operating margin for quarter four. A lot as the other hospitals, it's because of the COVID relief funds. Uh, Brattleboro has been, um, since 2015, has been pretty good about their performance actual to budget. They've been higher in 15, a little lower in 16. And then gradually, they have not been meeting their budgets until 2019. They were basically right on their budget. And then, of course, at COVID, they're not meeting their budget. And they're requesting 92,800 budget 21, which is uh, a substantial increase from their 2019 actuals and also their, of course, projection. Uh, and budget. Um, the operating margin has been up in, and down, as you can see, from 2015 through to 2019. Uh, 2017 and 18 were very low, a minus 3.1% operating margin and a minus 2.4%. They started to see about break even in 2019. And because of COVID, they were going to be seeing a positive operating margin for their projection 20 and hopefully to be about breaking even for the 2021 budget. Slide 80, thank you. The change in charge, this is where we mentioned the overall change in charge total is 4.9%. And the NPR due to change in charge is $2.1 million and it's a value uh, 436,000, which is a value of 1% change in charge. They will be making adjustments to their inpatient change in charge at 5.9%, which is the combination of their COVID and their over uh, standard, and the outpatient is 5.5%. 5 
So 2.9% of the standard change in charge for commercial is 1.3 million and 2% of the COVID change in charge for commercial is almost $900,000. The change in charge is 46% of their growth from 20 to 21, of four, which is 4.6 million, 500, excuse me, $4,700,000. And the, like I mentioned, the change in charge is 46% of that. They have been averaging 3% for five years from 2016 through 2020 for their change in charge. Our recommendations on slide 84. Oops, excuse me, the payer mix. Sorry, you can go back one more for the payer mix. There, thank you. Um, their payer mix has been uh, changing quite a bit and we did ask them at the hearing and they were saying that, um, especially in the last year or so, they were going through a general ledger finance system uh, computer change. So we're not quite sure if these are as accurate as they could be, but this is what they presented to us and did not make any changes. Um, I can't speak any more on that for this particular hospital. And um, their NPR as a percentage of gross revenue has been basically between the 46 and the 47% range from 2019 to 2021. Um, we will probably be asking more information on this during their monthly reporting um, to make sure that their accounting system is more accurate and that they are giving us more accurate information. So staff recommends that because the hospital requested a 5.3% increase from their 2020 budget, that we reduce the NPR growth to 4.3% with those accounting adjustments and provided transfers, which, and it is worth 4.8%. The COVID and standard change in charge is equal to the 4.9% of which 2% is COVID. We recommend reduce the change in charge to 2.9%. We feel that um, the, uh, the provider tax for this particular hospital was built off 2021 budget by mistake. It should have been based off from at least their 2020 projection. This is overstated by about $821,000, which is equivalent to approximately 2% change in charge. So that's part of the reason why of our, our recommendation. This hospital is projecting a 2.6% margin for 2020. We feel that approving the standard change in charge as submitted, this is, the line with their, is in line with their five-year average. And like I mentioned, the payer mix and reimbursement assumptions last year and this year should be more accurate and not spread overall to all payers as they stated at their budget hearing. So um, like I said, we're, we're gonna be updating the motion language, but right now we're asking you move to approve Broward Memorial Hospital with an NPR increase of 4.3% from fiscal year 2020 to 21 budget and an effective NPR FPP increase of 4.8% from the fiscal year 20 to 21 budget and a 2.9% increase to overall charges estimated reduce ex and re to reduce their expenses accordingly. This is subject to the standard budget conditions out as outlined in slide 27. We also encourage this hospital to improve their timeliness and accuracy of data submissions. Lori, um, they weren't the only hospital that it appeared that there was a mistake on the uh, provider tax. I'm wondering, did you reach out to Brattleboro to get confirmation from them that it was indeed a mistake? And what about the other hospital that, that uh, also appeared to have made a mistake? We did Go ahead. We, we did not reach out to them because we... Um, basically um, did our own analysis and double checked with them. And they, we have a few other hospitals that we will be presenting that same type of information to you. Well, since we're not voting, they'll have an opportunity if, if we uh, have made a mistake to uh, correct us, so. Right, thank you. 
Yeah, I just have a couple comments on this one. Um, can you roll back to slide 77? And, um, you know, this is a theme that that is occurring, you know, throughout as we look at these. And I, I just want to kind of, um, you know, go through some of the assumptions and one of the factors that I'm going to be looking at. So if you look at the 20 budget, it was 88 million. Their 20 projection is 78 million. So they're off 10 million. And then they're, um, go back up for a sec. I have the numbers in front of me too, but so in 77, the slide I was on. So what I'm looking at is the 20 budget was 88,145. The 20 projection is 78 million. So they're off about $10 million. Their 20 budget of 88 million to 21 request is up slightly over $4 million. So, so to me, the net of those two is they're still down 6 million. So I, I appreciate that they have requested a 5.3% 5, 5 change to 20 budget. But one of the things I'm certainly considering is what did they, you know, kind of what's that two year look at it as what, what did they lose in 20 and what are they gaining in 21? And I know that is one of the things we did talk about if we were to look at enforcement at one of the pieces we would look at. So I just want to put that piece in. And the other thing, because um, I haven't stated it yet, and, and I'm sure people on the other end are waiting for me to say it, you know, every number is wrong in these budgets. I mean, I appreciate they're trying to put them together, but, you know, all their assumptions are not correct. So some may be a little more aggressive on what they're thinking in the top line than others, and we won't know until the end of the year. So I wouldn't, um, I wouldn't necessarily penalize them for that. I also respect that this was one of the few hospitals that came in and separated a standard and a COVID number in there when they looked at their, their 4.9%. Um, so if we, if we were to cut them back um, as suggested by the staff, you know, I, I could still be comfortable with a 2.9% standard and potentially a 2% COVID and the reason why is if you roll now to slide um, 82, um, this hospital has has struggled um, in the past. So in 17 and 18, they lost quite a bit of money. 20, they had been, um, they, they are making in their 20 projection, getting some of that back, but their 21 budget of 4.42 and half a percent is is relatively low as a percent um, of operating margin. So even if we drop the 800,000 of the provider tax, which is you know one thing that yes that was that was an error, so that's different than a budget miss. But even if we drop that to the bottom line it still puts them at 1.5%. So, you know, these are some of the factors I think that I'm looking at as we go through these, you know, not not just are they, is the top number too high, but, you know, how has this hospital performed um, in the past? So I just wanted to put that out there because I do respect that they separated the COVID piece and so that will go away. So they're actually asking, you know, for a 3%, 2.9% increase. And I'm not sure if we went, um, on the staff's recommendation of 2.9, if we would make some of that COVID or not, if that would be the suggestion. Um, but I do think looking at their historical performance and that they were not coming in looking for 21 budget to be at a two or 3% margin is also important. So, um, and the fact again, that they're missing quite a bit on 20 budget to projection and not making that difference up in their 21 forecast. Um, you know, because I do have concerns about the prior, you know, 2017 and 18 performance and 2019 at 0.8 was was not, um, you know, a huge uh, margin. So um, that's a factor here. So that's all. Hey, Lori, this is Tom. One comment on the provider tax. Yes. Um, they did submit a response um, and basically what they said was is that um, and I can read it to you is that um, <clears throat> the new tax rate was based on the actual annualized net patient revenues for the time period October 1 2019 through March of 31 2020 
was to a great extent, and, and then they say that diva, there's a true up at the end of the year, which is true. But, you know, some, some hospitals, it seems to me, had a methodology for calculating their private um, provider tax. And, you know, it, you, and it was based on kind of an assumption of the, that the tide is always rising. And one hospital said point blank, but, you know, uh, there was a, uh, you know, a, um, a stick put in the spoke of the wheel. And so, um, so here you have a hospital using its traditional methodology of estimating the provider tax, uh, thinking that it was going to be a normal situation of a rising tide when, in fact, after March 31st, the tide started going out. And so that is, uh, so there, you know, there is, um, a lot of variance, I think, about the provider tax um, across all hospitals, and we just might want to think about, you know, uh, keeping it simple and saying, here's the methodology. You had a 2020 projection. You know, we should budget at six percent of that, and kind of, uh, 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 you know, try, uh, think about applying a standard to all hospitals as opposed to uh, a kind of picking and choosing and getting into the weeds. The, the other issue I'd just like to mention um, is, is I, I view this process more as steering than rowing and, and try to restrain from getting into the weeds too much of how a hospital, um, uh, you know, a allocates its, its NPR, um, you know, it, it, you know and, and plus we have the uh, sustainability pr process uh, just down the road with us. But here's a situation where um, Brattleboro has afforded or budgeted a 4% uh, increase across the board for its staff and a $15 uh, minimum wage. And um, whereas other hospitals we see have furloughs and layoffs and uh, staff staff reductions, et cetera. So I just, you know, I don't have a, you know, I don't have a, a you know, a conclusion about that. It's just thinking about it, that, that, that staff obviously is a, is a big part of a hospital's budget. And and some go, are going in one direction, and others have gone in another. And whether or not you know, we should consider that, um, I, I personally feel that we probably shouldn't uh, let a hospital do what a hospital can within the steering um, co constraints that, that 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 we apply to them. But um, I just wanted to have that on the table as as an example of. Um, of, of 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 an opportunity, I guess, that Brattleboro might have that other hospitals can't afford their employees. Thank you, Tom. Thank you. Um, Chair Mullen, I would also like to read address the question you had. If we address ask the hospitals that were uh, seem to have a large variance on their provider tax, we did approach them, and we also did our own analysis to Tom's point, where we took like the February year to date information and annualized it. And that's why some of the recommendations are before you today. So let me ask you a question about that, Lori, because I, I thought that um, the way the calculation was done at AHS was they took six months, which would have been through the end of March, if I'm correct, multiplied that times two, divided by 12, and then ch charged them for nine months. And then there was the final three months where the true up occurred. And have I got that wrong as far as the way it's calculated? That's basically correct. And we did that type of calculation where we, we took year to date February, we took year to date March and come up to an annualized amount that they probably should have reported for their provider tax. And we found a few of the hospitals uh, quite a large discrepancy. Okay, so when you did the year-to-date February, did you just change the assumption and uh, um, calculate a monthly amount since it was only five months to come out with that uh, amount? Yes. Okay. Yeah, and Kevin, just to chime in here, Lori's right, we did reach out. Board Member Pelham was asking the question where he saw notable discrepancies in some of this. And we reached out to stakeholders at DIVA and others in the state just to try to understand if we're, are we seeing something? Are we misjudging something? And everyone kept coming back and saying, there's been no guidance put forth besides what the normal methodology is. And <clears throat> it would seem that some people are not actually factoring in the 
net revenue um, losses that were coming in in April, May, and to some extent June. So the taxable base is coming down for this year. We don't believe anybody is going to tax the subsidies that have come in from the federal government. And therefore, the taxes should not be going up if the taxable base is coming down. So where we've seen sizable discrepancies, we're trying to utilize um, those discrepancies uh, to make sure that we're not giving rate increases where that tax is just going to fall to the bottom line. So if you're not getting taxed on it, what's the value of that compared to your uh, commercial request? And can we dial that back a bit and they can find those savings in the bottom line when they're not taxed for that amount that they've budgeted? So in the um, projections that you were using to try to calculate the appropriate amount, did you use the actual hospital projections for the full year 20? I believe we did. We did both. Yeah, we did it a few different ways. Yeah. Okay. We, we just could not, we could not reach the same figures that some of these hospitals were reaching. And with the, uh, there was a varying of answers that were coming across from the hospitals, which caused even more confusion um, around a methodology that's pretty set in stone from what we've come to understand from the folks at Diva. So, we tried to run a, a variety of different calculations for reasonableness, and we never got within um, anywhere within range of some of the hospitals who have these large overages. Okay, thank you. Other questions about Brattleboro before we move on? Proceed. All right, Mona Scutney. Mona Scutney is asking for a 4.7% growth rate from 20 to 21 budget. The 21 budget is 56,300,000. Their projection is 47,900,000. And the uh, growth rate between their FY20 projection and their 21 request is 17.6%. Uh, the change in charge includes a COVID. So they're at total changing charges 4.3% of which 2.2% is COVID and 2.1% is the standard overall change in charge. And they have spread those charges between the three payers, commercial Medicaid and Medicare. The hospital gave a justification of that they are 94 to 95% of normal for the 21 budget, uh, meaning normal per pre-COVID. The, they are having cost savings. They said that they are terminating their pension. And we understood that to mean the older pension where um, it's a quite a obligation on their books. So this is, and they're also limiting their retirements. They have flat benefits for year to year, from year to year, that's what they're budgeting. They are not budgeting or even, or excuse me, booking a reserve, this is equal to $1.5 million. And this reserve is in relationship to one care. The COVID 2.2% is for the ongoing COVID related expenses, such as supply, staffing, equipment. And they said to replenish their cash. They also needed it for urgent deferred capital investments. The, um, they have seven to 10 new FTEs for COVID safety. And they also have added capacity for their mental health. Next slide, please. Um, we didn't consider the information that Manuscutney sent about their providers. We did reach out to asking if these were traditional provider transfers and basically said that they were not because they were not coming from independent providers. But we thought the board should be aware that this information could explain some of their increase in their NPR FPP growth. So they had a urologist who was from another hospital and that increased their NPR FPP is worth their NPR FPP of $640,000 or 1.2% adjustment for NPR FPP. And that was effective this last year in March. They also have a neurologist that is worth almost $300,000 in NPR FPP. That will be effective 
at the beginning of October, and that is worth a 0.6% NPR FVP adjustment. Next slide, please. And this is the detail of each one of those expansion of services. So this one is the urologist. And like I mentioned, this came from another hospital and they felt that their community still needed this particular service. So they took it on and it was worth $237,000 of NPR, but they also have regular NPR, but they also have ancillary NPR of over 400,000. So um, I included both of those in our analysis. And um, this particular provider ha is not even a full provider, it's a part-time provider. And they have 1.6 non-provider FTEs. And as mentioned on the previous slide, it's 0.6% impact on NPR FPP. And like um, Brattleboro, we're asking the board to recommend acknowledgement of this enhancement. The next slide is for the um, neurologist. And this one is another part-time uh, provider, but they're sharing the services with the Veterans Hospital. And they're saying uh, the NPR is 171,000 with ancillary NPR of 126,000. And this is, like I mentioned, a part-time FTE provider and part-time non-providers. And this would be a 1.2% impact on NPR. And we recommend the board to acknowledge this enhancement of services also. So, Lori, um, before you move on, focusing on that uh, provider transfer Please. adjustment, um, it's easy for me to understand the uh, urologist. It um, moved over from a neighboring hospital, and their um, NPR FPP is declining at the neighboring hospital. So um, I think that the, the system... Uh, balances out on that. Help me understand um, the neurologist and um, is this just a long time needed service that um, is finally being filled or what's the justification here? That That's basically what you, it, we understood this to be and also considering they were sharing it with the Veterans Hospital, which is close by. Okay, thank you. Slide 90, please. And um, Mount Escutney's operating performance for fiscal year 20 has been um, pretty consistent for at least the first two quarters is like all the other hospitals and then dipped in quarter three and then they came back up to past quarter one. So they're at $13.5 million for the NPR FPP. The um, operating margins, that was, they were having a little bit of trouble the first two quarters of the year. And I think they had also mentioned when they were talking to us that they might've had some, um, they were getting more rehab, I believe, into their hospital from Dartmouth. And they were trying to understand that information also. Um, the Quarter four is where they saw the $1.7 million in operating margin, which as all the other hospitals is part of COVID relief funds also. Slide 91, please. Um, this hospital has been uh, pretty low on their, um, the first two years, 15 to 16, they didn't meet their budget, 17 they did, 18, and then um, 19 they they didn't. And um, for fiscal year 20, of course, they're not meeting their budget, but they're expecting 56,300,000 for their fiscal year 2021, which is 17.6% increase from their projected 20. Their operating margins have been, um, up and down through the years and in 17 and 18 they made pretty good but it was um 2.7 percent in 17 1.9 percent in 18 they basically broke even in 19 and they're expecting to just about break even in fiscal year 20. 
um, this hospital um, for their fiscal year 20, they didn't really even budget an operating margin. They were breaking even. So they were coming in um, the beginning of the year almost on budget or above budget, but then of course COVID hit and that affected them um, drastically. So, um, fisc uh, excuse me, thank you. <laughs> the uh, change in charge for this hospital is 4.3%, which is a combination of the COVID of 2.2 and standard of 2.1%. The NPR due to change in charge is equal to 1 million nine. And this hospital is changing their inpatient charges by 2.9%, outpatient by 2.9. But they're also changing their professional services by 1.5. And this hospital has a skilled nursing of 2.9, they're changing 2.9%. The hospital's um, payer mix for their standard and COVID is presented here. And the standard is equal to 933,756 of all the three payers. The COVID change in charge for a total payer mix is 987,626. And that's represented here also how they are expecting to um, allocate these change in charges by payer. The change in charge though is 76% of their growth from 20 to 21 for NPR. And this hospital's uh, change in charges is 4.3% on a five year average annual increase. Their largest was in 16 and then recently they've been um, between 2.9 2 and 3.2. So um, going to our recommendations on slide 93. Oops, excuse me. I keep on getting that one mixed up. Payer mix. Sorry, Patrick. 93, please. Um, this hospital's Medicare has been at 61% in 2019, which is the most, uh, most recent actual data. And then they're budgeting 58% of their payer mix in Medicare. For commercial, they were at 35% for fiscal year 19, and they're budgeting 35% for commercial uh, this year. The, the um, change was basically in their projection 20, where they're asking for 39% in their payer mix. Um, their reimbursement ratio, which is the NPR to gross revenue, was 49% in 19, and they're budgeting 52% in 21. Next slide, please. So staff recommends we approved this budget as submitted. So the hospital is asking for 4.7% NPR growth from fiscal year 20 to 21 and a 4.3% change in charge. We asked the board to acknowledge the enhanced services that were presented. And um, we expect that the um, the motion language would be to move to approve Mount Scutney's budget estimated with a 4.7% increase from fiscal year 2020 to 2021 budget NPR FPP and a 4% increase to overall charges as subject to the standard budget conditions as outlined on slide 27. Our recommendations are basically because Mount Scutney's operating margins are slim, typically break even, and as of fiscal, um, February 2020, they were operating at a 7.4% below budget on their NPR. The 4.3% change in charge is consistent with their five-year average. And in the last two years, the change in charge averaged 3.05%. The last three years was an average of 3.67%. So just to give you a little bit more statistics on this hospital, um, that's our recommendations. Lori, uh, the CEO reached out to our executive director and said that they had, um, like Rutland, um, decided um, to participate uh, in Medicare in the ACO. And um, I believe he communicated to her that they would be filing um, a request for a change in their budget. Have we seen anything yet? We were not aware of this change, so no. 
Okay. So I, I guess um, the my recommendation would be to reach out to uh, um, David and ask him uh, when you would expect to see whatever the changes that they're requesting. Okay, thank you. Uh, Lori, just a comment on this, on the change in charge when you guys put the recommendations. Um, can you put the, that it's 2.1 standard and 2.2 COVID related? Because I think it's important, you know, this was another hospital that did request that split and that obviously is a big influence for what the rate would be in the following year. Thank you, Maureen. Yes, I noticed we missed that too. We will break that out. Yeah, yeah, and I would say that. And and the other one, just on this one, that's always a little bit harder to pick out is, you know, in the past, Dartmouth has contributed money to help fund them and then pulled that away, yet they have a lot of borders and other things that they end up, you know, many times getting patients from Dartmouth that don't make money, but it's all part of their system. So, so it's a little bit hard to look at their profitability and isolation um, because of that, because of the, you know, impacts Dartmouth has had coming in and out, helping them favorably and then maybe not helping them. Certainly they're getting benefits from changing their pension and the way they're doing that. I believe they were getting some benefits from that. So I think um, I think those are important to for at least to be us to be thinking about. And I guess the other thing as it comes down the pike, if they're putting in a request to put increase their commercial to fund the ACO reserves, is that is that what we want to do? I mean, just throwing that out there. Hi, Laurie, it's Tom again. Just one factual question. I tried to follow the bouncing ball through Scutney's uh, presentations having to do with the borders and the 700,000. And I, after trying to follow the bouncing ball, was still unclear whether they are reserving $700,000 in their 2021 budget in, in case they can't find appropriate homes for for these folks, or is it that that reserve was in 2020 and they're using it because they can't find homes for these uh, borders and that they did not build a reserve into their 2021 budget? So is there a $700,000 reserve for borders in their 2021 budget? That's my question. Okay, we'll check into that. Thank you. Thank you. One last um, maybe request when we're putting the fiscal year 21 request, could you be in, uh, make clear whether you're inclusive? That's inclusive of the 1.8% NPR increase that's really related to the expansion of services, right? Yes, yes, okay. So it just might be helpful since there is an expansion of services in here to to denote that. Thank you. Thank you. And again, I um, to follow up on that, I'm a little bit leery of combining the two of them together because I don't think the urologist is really an expansion of services to the overall system. So we might wish to break that out as one being an expansion. And even the neurology, my question would be, is that um, dollars that have been traditionally going out of state, for example, the Dartmouth for neurology services, that are now going to be kept in state, which is a would be a good thing if it was kept in state. So um, there there are questions about the uh, two practice transfers, or or not really a transfer, but a <laughs> the new practices. Let's put it that way. Yeah, and I think that was my point: is that if it's one point eight, that's money that's already in the system. It was just you know being delivered somewhere else. Then it's not the same as a 4.7% increase without that. So that would be helpful. Thank you. Okay, we'll double check on that. Thank you. This is Robin. I just had one uh, request when we get, um, if they do come back with some changes to their budget that is related to the ACO reserve, could we could you remind us of their current assumptions in their budget relating to the reserving? I'll go back through my notes as well, but I 
I seem to recall them being pretty conservative compared to the other hospitals. Okay. Yeah, I think we're going to have to have a walkthrough of the whole uh, reserve issue again if they seek to amend. So let's uh, find out quickly whether or not they're actually seeking to amend or if that was an off the cuff comment made to the executive director. Okay, thank you. Other questions on Mount Scotney or comments? Okay, proceed, Patrick. I'm still on. Okay, proceed, Lori. <laughs> <laughs> um, we decided that we divided it up like this instead of like we did the other day or every other one. Um, the Northwestern is another hospital who had some changes in their provider transfers and accounting adjustments. So we'll see that in a few minutes. Um, this hospital is requesting a negative 0.2% growth rate for their NPR FPP from fiscal year 20 to 21 budgets. This is a 19.8% growth from their fiscal year 20 projection to the 21 budget. They are a negative 16.7% It's a for their budget to projection variance. So their request for their 21 budget is 116,693,229. This is of course less than the 3.5% growth rate ceiling. This hospital is another one who is asking for a split change in charge. Uh, their COVID is 1.18% and standard is 19.9%. So a total of 21.1% change in charge. And most all of the change in charge is going to be for commercial payer. The standard is going to be for 11,500 and the COVID is close to $700,000. The hospital justified their budget. Um, they were seeking parity in their change in charge with their peers in order to remain flexible, flexi excuse me, financially stable. They are seeing a service area growth volume and it's continuing to improve. They are evaluating their capital needs for their fiscal year 2021. And they have a $7 million approved CON for the ED expansion. And that is gonna be paid through their cash reserves and not through rates. They're investing in primary care, pediatrics, OBGYN, and in, they're strengthening their intensive care and sleep services in this budget. They're restructuring their lifestyle medicine into primary care. The RISE Vermont is resized for sustainability and alignment with the ACO. Uh, they transitioned the Northwestern Hope and Recovery and Outpatient Neurology to community partners. This was included in their 2020 budget. They're not in compliance with the debt service ratio covenant because of their low operating margins and other covenants that um, trigger these issues with their banks. And this is a historically low cost hospital. So this is where I split out the, and we're calling them again, service enhancements and provider transfers. They transferred cold, hollow family practice out of their hospital because they found that they were not they were not able to transfer this particular practice into the hospital. And then, as we heard this summer, their Northwestern Partners in Hope also was transferred out of the hospital to a community provider. They have um, budget two service enhancements. The ICU through telehealth, we heard this last spring when they asked for amended budget, and then the Northwestern pulmonology. The um, provider transfers are equal to one point, a negative $1.3 million for NPR or 0.9% impact on the NPR. The service enhancements are worth one, almost $1.6 million to NPR or a negative 1.5% impact if you compare it to their 20 budget. And they had an accounting adjustment because again, this hospital was asked to move the ACO dues from NPR to operating expenses, which was worth $931,000. And that's worth a negative 0.8% to NPR. Next slide, please. 
Uh, this is breaking it out again for the provider transfers and enhancements. Um, the cold hall of family practice, uh, that is effective for this year, October, and the Northwestern Partners in Hope was effective July 31st. The ICU telehealth with Dartmouth is supposed to be effective for April 1st, 2021, and the Northwestern Pulmonology is supposed to be effective for October 1st, 2020. Next slide, please. And another look at these transfers. So they, as they mentioned in their budget, they did not acquire the cold hall of family practice as they expected in last year's budget. So they're taking it completely out of the 2021 budget. And we are asking the board to acknowledge this transfer in this budget. This is equivalent to one provider. Oops, okay, go ahead. Um, one provider FTE, eight non-provider FTEs, and a 0.65% impact on NPR. Then the next slide is where we talk about the um, Northwestern Partners in Hope and Recovery that we heard about this summer. They um, had it, uh, they could no longer support this uh, practice in their hospital, so it went to, um, transferred to the community and that's had one provider FTE and 11 non-provider FTEs, and it was worth 0.25% impact on NPR. And again, we asked the board to acknowledge this transfer. This is, they're calling this um, expansion of services. Um, this is where they want to have telehealth ICU in partnership with Dartmouth effective next year, April 1st. And um, it's to retain the lower acuity ICU patients and allow them to receive services locally. This does not have any provider FTEs, but it does have five non-provider FTEs. And this is equal to a 1.3% impact on NPR. I'm, we're calling it a negative 1.3% impact because you compare it to 2021. And we are asking the board to acknowledge this expansion of services. Uh, this provider is again, not an acquisition, but a routine expansion of services for Northwestern and it's Northwestern pulmonology. This is effective for this coming October 1st. And this one is, has incorrect information on the side about Dartmouth and Hitchcock and about telehealth. Um, but this one is supposed to be an enhancement of services. It's equal to 273,810 NPR, and it is a negative 0.2% impact on NPR, and GMCB staff would like the board to acknowledge this enhancement of services. I can, we will adjust this slide in the next round of our presentation. Um, Northwestern's operating performance for fiscal year 2020, they were um, doing pretty good like all the hospitals the first quarter, and then, but their operating margins were still very low all year. They were negative operating margins, um, and they are expecting to be at a growth of $25.6 million in their quarter four for NPR FPP but it still is gonna get them a negative operating margin of $2.4 million or a negative 9%. Um, they have been struggling with their EMR and their um, volumes for quite a few months from since last year's budget, basically. This, this is showing the historical operating performance since 2015. They were doing very well, 15, 16, and um, we're about the same of their budget in 17. And then it started to erode in 18, 19. And then they're hoping for 21 at 116,700, 116,700,000. They expect a projection of 97,400, 97,400, excuse me. Um, their operating margins, as you saw in 15, at the bottom in 15 was over $10 million. 
and 16 was very profitable. And then it started to go under at negative operating margins from 17 through 19 through projected 20. And they hope to have a positive operating margin of 2.3% or 2,800,000 in fiscal year 21. Their change in charge, the total change in charge is 21.1%. And this and their NPR change in charge um, from and from their NPR due to change in charge is 12,200,000. This is valued at 578,900 uh, at 1% change in charge. The standard request for hospital inpatient ch change in charge to gross revenue is 25.37% for inpatient and outpatient. And then for COVID, they're asking for 1.53% percent for inpatient and outpatient. So their service categories are changing accordingly. Um, on their payer mix for the change in charge, it's all going to be going asking for the commercial change in charge. And COVID is 19.9, excuse me, 19.9 is standard change in charge. And COVID is 1.18% change in charge. We couldn't do a change in charge as a percent of NPR increase because they are a negative increase from 20 to 21. It's at the negative 233,000. And as mentioned above, their change in charge is worth $12 million, 200,000. They have an average five, they have a five-year average of their change in charge that was approved at 0.7%. Last year, they asked for a 5.9% change in charge and it was approved. We feel that uh, some of these hospitals who asked for these higher change in charges didn't necessarily get a chance to realize those change in charges because of the lower volumes due to COVID. Um, the payer mix for Northwestern Medical Center from 2019, they were at 34% for Medicare and they are budgeting 28% for fiscal year 21. And then for commercial, there were 50% in fiscal year 19, and they're budgeting 55% in fiscal year 21. Medicaid has been around 16, 18, 17%. So basically around the same percentage of their NPR. Their reimbursement rates were at 50% in 19, and they're going to 45% in fiscal year 21 budget. The NPR growth of a negative 2% request by the hospital, we are recommending that that's being reduced by our recommendation for the change in charge. The 21.1% change in charge is split with COVID and COVID is 1.18%. We recommend to remove 7.25% change in charge attributable to the ACO dues risk reserve funding, and lower payments on services performed. Reduce the submitted change in charge to 12.67% the standard rate, and then the 13.85% including COVID. Um, we expect them with reducing the NPR accordingly with the change in charge that they also reduce their expenses. So this particular hospital as of February, um, was operating at 7.3% below budget and moving the 7.25% change of charge associated with the ACO um, seems reasonable to staff. The keeping should be keeping with the keeping our staff, um, Patrick and I and Kate and the board updated with any cost mitigation efforts related to their EMR because we knew they had been struggling with that project for the last year. So we suggest move to approve Northwestern Medical Center's budget with an NPR FPP increase in accordance with, however, the change in charge uh, flushes out from fiscal year 2021 budget, a 13.85% increase to overall charges as submitted, reduce their expenses accordingly and subject to the standard budget conditions as outlined in slide 27. We also ask that this Hospital improve the timeliness of data submissions. Yeah, and if I, uh, if I may jump in real quick, uh, Sonny, this is Patrick. We were 
uh, we were very impressed with the presentation that Northwestern gave, uh, especially around some of their efforts to control costs. And the one thing that stood out to us uh, the most, I believe, was the efforts to mitigate the impact of the electronic medical record that they rolled out last year. When they came to us in April for a rate increase, that was not something that uh, was really well explained at the time. And we thought Northwestern's efforts to <clears throat> efforts to date to offset and mitigate some of those um, the losses that have been incurred by that and their continued roadmap um, to further mitigate some of those costs were very, very important. But we would like to see updates on that in the future because we don't believe uh, their work is done. But um, we thought they took the board's um, comments in April and considerations very seriously for this budget. And <clears throat> the 13.85% rate increase is, is very substantial in nature. And um, we just believe that with the historical change in charges that this is something that has to be done with the low cost um, nature of their hospital. They need more revenues, period, from our perspective. But we also want to see them continue to make those efforts to offset some of the um, cost incurred by the electronic medical record. So I just wanted to add that in there because we thought they made a pretty strong case for that in their presentation. I guess I would just love to hear more from the staff about why the 7.25 as it relates to the ACO as the choice, um, the lever to reduce that commercial rate. I believe we felt it was kind of cross purposes with the nature of the um, all payer model um, to utilize fee for service payments to offset the um, cost of doing business with the ACO. It wasn't something we were entirely clear on. We haven't heard that as a justification from many hospitals. We just heard that Mount of Scutney may employ uh, a similar um, change in charge methodology and we just did not feel that that was a justified component of this others may feel differently but we talked about it um, for quite a long period of time and we just could not get our minds around um, subsidizing <clears throat> that component to date um, that's part of the uh, risk that you take when you sign a contract with the aco and we did not want to see uh, commercial rate payers foot the bill for uh, enrollment in the all payer model. That was our angle when we decided to remove that piece from the change in charge. Okay, thank you. And actually, I mean, the board has had a history of not allowing um, the ACO costs to roll into commercial rates. So it's consistent with decisions the board has made in the past, but I just wanted to hear more from you all about that, this, that recommendation. Thank you. Other comments or questions about Northwestern? This is Robin. Um, I'm so when you were talking about um, some of the justification for the standard charge recommendation, you mentioned that they didn't have the opportunity in 20 to realize some of the rate increase because of the drop in volume. I'm wondering why it wouldn't make more sense to put uh, some value for that in the COVID related, since that seems like it's most likely to be time limited in the grander scheme of things rather than building it into the charge base. I believe that's probably a question for Northwestern. Uh, we're just presenting their their budget as submitted and, and this the imposition of um, COVID rates that weren't asked for is not something that we were operating under when we were creating some of these recommendations where we were sticking to the, the guidance where the hospital had to request a COVID component. So we haven't gone back and tried to uh, work with um, shifting any of the standard rates over to COVID to date. So we haven't planned around that at all. Thank you. That was helpful explanation. Wasn't sure if it was you or Lori, Patrick. <laughs> <laughs> you you get me for the next three hospitals. <clears throat> All right, and we will round out our presentation today with the three hospitals that operate within the UVM Health Network. <clears throat> First up is Porter Medical Center. They are uh, 
requesting an NPR FTP growth of 2.7%, which is within the uh, Green Mountain Care Board's 3.5% growth rate ceiling. They are not requesting an overall change in charge. However, they are requesting a 5.75% uh, commercial effective rate to their change in charge. And as you can see on slide 108 in the upper right-hand corner, uh, the value of the commercial is about 1.6 million, <clears throat> and they have um, reduced their Medicare uh, change in charge values by 350,000. Uh, there is no budgetary assumptions pertaining to COVID, no risk reserve for FY21. They are uh, rolling over what they've reserved in the past, so that is maintaining on the balance sheet. Uh, they need to balance and manage expense growth, and necess it's necessary to continue to support the nursing home. And we'll come back to that last piece um, as we move through the presentation, because that stuck out with staff um, as far as considering the, the recommendation for this particular hospital. So slide 109, again, we are seeing similar trends. The hospital was operating um, under budget <clears throat> in February, about 7.1%. You can see the first two quarters are, are mimicking what we saw through February. Then again, the impact of COVID in quarters three and the projections for quarter four um, with a rebound to NPR FPP north of 21.6 million and an operating uh, margin <clears throat> for the fourth quarter of about $1.5 million. Uh, historically, this has been a uh, solid hospital for in the last few years for um, operating. They are producing uh, uh, operating margins that are certainly within reason. They had a high of 5.2% in 2019. 4.7 million. They are budgeting for 4.5 percent this year, four, just shy of 4.4 million, which uh, that percentage outstrips every other hospital submission uh, in this year. And we have seen everything from almost break even with Southwestern up to a high of 4.5 percent with Porter Medical Center. They are uh, budgeting to attain almost 90 million dollars in NPR FPP this year. Um, historically, their last full fiscal year. They surpassed uh, 84 million or 84.9 million dollars, and slightly exceeding their budget in 2019. And of course, with the uh, COVID component this year factoring into NPR, they are not going to meet their FY20 uh, projected figures for their budget. <clears throat> Breaking down the change in charge, as I stated previously, they are going to increase their gross charges by zero percent. The uh, commercial effective rate as submitted is 5.75. This adds $1.2 million in MPR. The value of that is 1% of that is $278,000. <clears> and because they are not increasing their gross charges, there is no allocation across those service categories that were offered. The commercial component as stated previously is about $1.6 million and Medicare is being reduced by 350,000. The change in charge is a percentage of NPR FPP increase is 54%. And historically, they've had a five-year change in charge that is right about middle of the pack um, at 3.8%. So they've been uh, pretty well-funded um, with Green Mountain Care Board decisions over those years, although in the past uh, few years, those figures are coming down slightly from what has been approved in fiscal 16 and 17. <clears throat> Uh, payer mix remains relatively consistent for this hospital. Uh, commercial hovers between 50 and 52% for the time periods up on slide 112. And Medicare operates between um, 40, uh, 35 and 40%. The 35 was for 2020 budget. Of course, that not coming to uh, reality um, can be omitted from that discussion because it, it appears that their projection is around 39 to 40%. And Medicaid is showing slight erosions there. Their NPR as a percentage of gross revenues um, is moving between 50 and 52%, and they are budgeting up uh, for 2021 as a percentage of gross revenues uh, as it pertains to their reimbursement rate. So with Porter Hospital, <clears throat> they requested 2.7%. This is within the budget to budget guidance. Um, however, we are reducing the um, effective rate from 5.7 to 3. There was a lot of discussion around inflationary factors and whatnot from the uh, network representatives. So we wanted to ensure that those figures between two and 3% were covered for this hospital. Um, so we would expect uh, expenses to be reduced accordingly. Um, 
if they want to attain that 4.5% operating margin. Um, but one of the things that came to us <clears throat> from the presentation was that they need to continue to support the nursing home. So we went and we began to look at some of the audited financials just to see what type of impact that nursing home has on the finances of the hospital, because it's very difficult for us to justify um, some of these numbers if we don't know what's happening with that entity. And we found that there have been transfers from fiscal year 17 to 19 of 1 million, 2.15 million, and 3.45 million, respectively, from Porter to the nursing home to cover the operational losses of that entity. And we could not justify ourselves um, continuing with a commercial effective rate of almost 6% when <clears throat> some of those monies are in those bottom lines are being transferred over to an entity that we have no um, authority over or uh, capacity to consider as part of this budget. Uh, and so we wanted to make sure that we were very cautious in our recommendation there because it certainly does have an impact on the bottom line of the hospital when these monies are uh, transferred over to that other entity. Again, if I go back up, <clears throat> Porter's operating margin in 19 was 4.7 million and there was a $3.45 million transfer to Helen Porter and that is pretty substantial. Um, and so with a 4.5% or $4.4 million operating margin this year, we would assume based on some of the historical figures here that there will be more money uh, transferred over to that entity and we wanted to be cautious when recommending an approval for that commercial rate. So <clears throat> we are recommending the 3% effective commercial rate and appropriate um, reduction to NPR due to that and also uh, reduction of expenses if they'd like to maintain the submitted 4.5% operating margin. And that concludes our piece on Porter. So if the board has any comments, we would welcome those. Okay, questions or comments on Porter? Oh yeah, can you go back to slide 111 for a minute? Uh, one thing here I think would be good to, to highlight in the future is, um, you know, when we're looking at the hospital inpatient, outpatient to gross charges, because I guess, um, let's go through, I guess, what they're doing. If you had a charge of $100 and this year commercial paid 80, I guess next year they're saying you have a charge of $100, but now commercial is going to pay, you know, 85 of that roughly, right? So, mm -hmm. so basically they're saying they're not increasing the gross charge, but they're reducing the deductions, right? So I think it would be important to understand how that plays out for hospital, inpatient, outpatient, and professional. So what's the commercial increase for those three? Um, because if they keep professional at zero, then it's higher for the other. So commercial is going up, although not on a gross charge, but on a net. Yes, we agree with that. Um, the effective rate, as we've looked at it a little more in depth this year, um, is certainly something that we need to unpack a little bit more in the years to come. I believe uh, board member Holmes brought that up um, a couple of meetings ago, and I think that's something we need to explore. We also need to make sure that we're hearing uh, the same story across the board. So where you're discussing that they're going back to negotiate um, <clears throat> less contractual allowances to maximize their commercial business more, um, we want to understand that is that how all the hospitals look at it? Or are they saying that at the end of the day, our effective rate is X, which means they've already done the negotiations and this is what they hope to achieve. So we want to make sure that we every, with the explanations are relative across the board to each other. To your point, we do want to get to know this more because we think it is important that um, for those hospitals who want to establish an effective rate that we make sure we understand um, what the impact is to the commercial payer in these budget proceedings. And then just a couple other things. When you know when we, when we talked about one of the prior hospitals, we talked about the salary increases and things they had in there and that they were able to absorb. And you know, Porter specifically talked about a $2.1 million cost of living adjustment that they have in their budget, which exceeds the entire commercial ask that they have in here. And, um, you know, I would just throw that out there because in, in these times right now with COVID, I would venture to say that most businesses are not able to afford a cost of living adjustment 
on top of on top of increases that they had in there. So this was above and beyond increases. Um, you know, and the other part for discussion on here, I, I appreciate the support for Helen Porter. I just think about, you know, how do we think about if a hospital, other hospitals want to invest in something that is going to continue to lose money every year and they need to fund it and it's being paid for of the rate payers who go to that hospital. So I'm not saying that Helen Porter is not something that should be supported. It just puts a different dynamic on this hospital where it's funding that out of its services and needs a higher margin. And, you know, other other hospitals may want to do that for their community as well. And what would we think about that? So I just put those couple things out there. And we we agree with that. We, we felt we didn't have enough information on that nursing home. We are positive it is a essential service in that community. Uh, but without the <clears throat> detail that would be required, we could not justify a recommendation that would uh, consider that as a factor. And I'll just follow up on that. I mean, nursing homes are essential services in, in every community. And um, this appears to be, once again, another cost shift um, away from pr appropriate government funding for services provided onto commercial um, insurance rate payers. And that's, that's what's problematic here, is that other, other areas, nursing homes are struggling everywhere in the state of Vermont. And likely that's due to the fact that they probably should be giving more of an increase in their rates through Dale. And, um, and, I, and I don't pretend to know exactly what the reimbursement rates are for homes, but I, I do think that um, this is another key component of trying to contain um, the growth of insurance rates if it's allowed to be transferred onto commercial hospital rate payers um, rather than through the more traditional means of um, reimbursement through the state of Vermont and Dale. So that one concerns me. And I do want to highlight again that uh, high operating margin. And it's something that I put in the back of my mind for possibly a component of guidance in 22's budgets, because I do think that um, there are justifications for varying um, operating margins, but we're not hearing those from the hospitals. One of the most uh, uh, reasonable being if you have the oldest age of plant in the state at your hospital and need to do serious capital upgrades, like for example, a Southwestern, you probably could justify a higher operating margin than someone who has had continual upgrades and um, uh, has a much uh, lower age of plant. So th it's just something to consider for next year's guidance that we may want to um, try to begin to formulate some type of targeted operating margin, um, realizing that there would still need to be variances. But um, it just seems that in, in many respects to um, this budget process that it doesn't seem fair when one hospital is asking for a half a percent operating margin and another is asking for a 4.5% operating margin. So those are just my ramblings. Kevin, can I ask a quick uh, clarifying question? Sure. Uh, on this slide, um, can somebody just remind me, Patrick or Lori, why Medicare is going down? 350,000, it looks like the payer mix is, is going up for Medicare. So I'm just, I'm trying to remember, I cannot recall why that would be a reduction in Medicare reimbursements. Neither can I, I would have to defer to Lori if she has anything. I, I don't have anything directly related to why, but sometimes it's because of their reimbursements. Um, they are aware that they were going to be receiving less, so they put that in the budget. They don't need that for Medicare. Um, we could double check for you if you'd like. Yeah, and that if was we see it on others. Would you like it if we see it on others also? Yeah, I think that, well, if, if you can't um, unpack why, that would be helpful to better understand. 
There might be something in some of the other hospitals where it's obvious why it's going down. Um, but in this particular case, it would be helpful to, for me to understand why it's going down, if you can sure. uncover that. Thank you, Lori. Uh, Central Vermont Medical Center is up next. We have a uh, submitted budget that requests an 8.7% growth over the fiscal year 20 budget, which is over and above the 3.5% growth ceiling set forth by the board. They are also submitting a 6% overall change in gross charges with an 8.5% increase in the commercial effective rate. Uh, the value of these changes are for commercial five, just under 5.3 million. And for Medicare, <clears throat> the assumption um, is a, a $183,000 um, dollar value to those changes. So the hospital's justifications are um, expenses have con uh, continued to exceed revenues since fiscal year 2017. Uh, they're being driven by salary and pharmaceutical costs. Um, they are undergoing a higher collection rate trend, an increase in volume of 1.5%, and their margin has been eroding due to shift in payer mix, growth in pharmaceutical and labor inflation, and unpredictable volumes. So again, on slide 115, we are seeing a similar trend. Um, the hospital, <clears throat> as of February, was operating 2.9% above budget on NPR. Um, however, the uh, operating margins per quarter continued to be in uh, negative territory. And again, you can see the similar path here uh, through COVID, um, with the exception that in the fourth quarter, they are again projecting uh, an operating margin loss, but rebound a rebound to their NPR FPP. Uh, so this is the hospital that in the last few years has struggled. It has produced uh, negative operating margins through um, fiscal year 17 through 19. And again, in 20 is projecting a $4.5 million operating loss. Um, the budget <coughs> is, uh, is expecting a, a half a percentage point operating margin or a value of $1.2 million on the positive. Um, and their NPR is being budgeted to rise significantly to 237, or $237 million. Um, their last actual year NPR FPP um, surpassed $211 million as well. And this year they were budgeted at 218. If you recall, they resubmitted their budget at about this time last year. Uh, so these figures are for that resubmitted budget. And again, due to COVID, they will not be hitting their budget as is the case with uh, all of the other hospitals in the state of Vermont. <clears throat> So a breakdown of their uh, charge request, again, overall 6% commercial effective rate, 8.5. The NPR value of that is 5.46 million, 1% is valued at 621,000. They will allocate their uh, increases at 6% across hospital inpatient, outpatient, professional services, and their skilled nursing facility at the 6% rate. Um, again, to recoup or recap here, uh, the commercial value, 5.283 million, Medicare, just over 183,000, and their change in charges percentage of MP, RFPP is 29%. Uh, this is another hospital who has had um, a middle of the pack, uh, blended five-year average uh, charge increase of 3.2%, uh, which does put them about in the middle of, of the uh, hospitals for the state of Vermont. Um, and the difference between that and what they've submitted is only uh, 0.2 percentage points difference. <clears throat> uh, payer mix tends to stay relatively stable for this hospital. The fluctuations up here look a little more significant than they are. Again, the 34% in Medicare on slide 118 for the 20 budget um, is not dipping that low. Their projections are around 39%, which is about with their fiscal year 19 actual at 38. And the commercial payers have dipped slightly, um, but that's compared to budget and uh, of uh, 2020. However, it is on par with their fiscal year 19 actuals. And their <clears throat> um, rate of reimbursement here is at 50%. And the reason that is looking like that is because there is rounding going on in there. So we will make sure we try to make that look a little flatter than it is uh, for the final slide deck when we move into voting. So the 8.7% increase is well above the um, growth rate ceiling set forth by the board, we would reduce that based on reductions to the uh, change in charge <clears throat> and the commercial effective rate 
Um, again, we have another hospital where the provider tax appears to be overstated by about $2 million. And so the reductions here um, would basically take that into account across the board. Um, we do believe that uh, if they are going to have rebounding volumes, that can probably be made up on the MPR side. But the uh, change in charges with what we think is an overage here and the provider tax could be reduced so that that is not cost is not shifted over to the uh, commercial payer and also reduce expenses accordingly. Um, they are projected to grow expenses between FY20 budget and FY21 budget by 8.2%. That exceeds every hospital with the exception of the state's largest hospital, which is the UVM Medical Center. Um, we would expect a hospital that resides within the health network to have greater buying power, greater negotiating power, and also be able to take advantage of the operational investments that the network is making, which should return um, cost savings initiatives, et cetera, to the bottom line of this hospital. And we, we, could, not, um, we could not justify or did not believe the 8.2% was justified um, with the change in charge. It would cover the inflation that the network representatives did discuss. Uh, however, the rest of that explanation we did not feel was justified in there presentation. So the 8.2% operating expense growth seems relatively high for a hospital that operates within a network. So we would like to see them um, realize some of those cost savings initiatives that are coming through the investments that they are making. And that concludes our piece on the Central Vermont Medical Center. So if the board members have any comments or questions, we'd be happy to address those. Question or comments on Central Vermont Medical Center? Hi, Patrick. This is Tom. Um, I have the same question uh, for Central Vermont and Woodridge as for Porter and Helen Porter that I think, as I recall, um, I asked during the uh, um, <clears throat> during the hearing what the relationship was between Woodridge and the hospital. And I walked away with the understanding that it was the same equivalent in terms of Woodridge and um, Central Vermont. And so, therefore, that same dynamic, that same issue, I think, presents itself, uh, although we have less information about Woodridge. I mean, I, it sounds like you haven't looked at, at uh, Woodridge's um, audited financial statement, but I just want to make sure that during the, the um, hearing that I heard it right, that basically Woodridge and Helen Porter are on equivalent footing with uh, Central Vermont and uh, Porter Hospital. Uh, Patrick, I'll take Woodridge is in, in the hospital where Porter Medical. I'm sorry, uh, Ms. Perry. Yes, I heard you got an echo. Got an echo. Can you start again, start please? again, please? Sounds like someone else, someone else wasn't it. Um, Porter Medical has Helen Porter outside of their hospital budget information that they present to us, where Woodridge is included in Central Vermont's hospital budget information presented to us. So it's it's kind of like, it is transparent. We have the information in adaptive. It is included in this budget. So we, are, we don't have as much of a concern because it is presented and they don't, as you saw in the change in charge, they say that they needed uh, change in charge for skilled nursing, where you don't see that in uh, Porter's for Helen Porter. I, I, I see what you're saying. So the link in terms of commercial and uh, um, Woodridge is clearer than the link between commercial at Porter and Helen Porter. And so you're trying to make them equally transparent. Basically, yeah. it all depends what hospital presents in within their budgets. If a hospital includes skilled nursing in their budgets, we will analyze and present accordingly. If they do not, we are, our hands are tied, but we try and inform the board of our concerns. Okay, thank you. So just to follow up on that, do we know what the specific bottom line impact is of Woodridge on the hospital? No, we do not, but we 
do, if you look at the operate, uh, audited financial statements for fiscal year 19, but not in their budgets, not the bottom line. We know gross charges for skilled nursing um, in their 20 budget, but we didn't ask them to separate it out for this 21 budget. When they entered into adaptive, we will have that information. So you could give us what 19 is, either now or later. It's in their audited financials and we can. Okay, thanks. Yeah, Maureen, we'll follow up with that. Okay, perfect. Um, just a quick question. If, if we're gonna be considering um, provider tax overstatements in our decisions about charges, um, it would be really helpful to see a chart with what the hospital submitted and then the analysis that the team did just so that we can see what the delta is and how that would factor into a, a reduction in charge. Would that be possible before our next round of conversation for the hospitals for, for whom you're thinking of uh, adjusting downward? Yes, we can do that. Thank you. Patrick, I, I didn't, isn't some of the work that um, uh, Caitlin did, uh, wasn't that sent out to the board? It was, yes. I believe Jess is looking for a, a slide that would that would show that to support oh, it. Is that, okay. is that okay. correct, okay. Jess? I got it. You've done the work. Yeah, just I just think slide. it should be part of the, the conversations in public about what the estimates are. Yeah. 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 Okay, moving on to the University of Vermont Medical Center. The FY21 request is a 5.7% MPR FPP increase over their fiscal year 20 budget, which does exceed the 3.5% growth ceiling. Uh, they are asking for both a 7.9% 7 .9 overall change in charge and commercial effective rate increase in the fiscal year 21 budget. The value of those commercial uh, dollars is about $37.7 million, and their Medicare assumption accounts for $3.8 million. Their justifications for their tertiary care <clears throat> volume continues to grow at the medical center. If the rate increase is not sufficient to cover inflation, the only option of the impact uh, is to impact the margin and get back on solid financial footing would be to eliminate services that lose money. Um, the increase in volume in patients creates an increase in expenses. They need 3% revenue increase to cover the 3% inflationary factor on total expenses. Um, if they're not getting the 3% from the government payers <clears throat> in the ACO, they need 6% from commercial payers, 50% of their revenue to keep pace with expense inflation. They are also um, justifying this budget by increasing their staffing of 18 physicians and 129 non-physician FTEs. So the medical center itself <clears throat> um, was operating at about 0.7% under budget pre-COVID. And as you can see in quarter one there, they were producing a small um, margin during that quarter. And then a combination of things happened in quarter two where they had to fund part of their pension and also the COVID impact on the back end of that uh, quarter began to drive the medical center's operating margin into negative territory. And they have just now begun to recover that um, in the aftermath of the first COVID wave that we've experienced in this state back in the spring. And of course, it does follow um, relatively to the rest of the hospitals in the state as far as the impact on NPR and their margins are concerned. <clears throat> Uh, historically, the hospital has operated slightly over budget. Last year, they were, or 2019, they were nearly on budget. And this year, as with the other hospitals, they are not going to meet their uh, budget projection. However, NPR growth um, as budgeted for 21 uh, is anticipated to grow over $1.4 billion. And most of the budget uh, presentation for the hospital, amongst other things, discussed the need to get back to a uh, operating margin that is necessary for them to make the continued um, improvements to um, patient health care and investments that come with that. And the uh, projected margin for this year at negative four obviously will not allow them to attain some of their, their goals for that hospital. However, the trend here is pretty stark from 2015 through the current day um, where the hospital was producing around 6% operating margins for a couple of years. That has since been in decline since that time. 
a breakdown of the change in charge on slide 123, 7.97% for the overall gross charges increase and commercial effective rate. Uh, the NPR impact of that is about $41.5 million. The value of 1% there is about 4.7. And they, were, they are going to allocate those changes in gross charges across hospital inpatient and outpatient at 8.5% and professional services at 6%. The change in charges, a percentage of their NPR increase is at 54%. Um, overall change in charges, their five-year average is 1.1%, while their commercial effective rate has been approved on average at 3.04%. So moving into the payer mix, this is a hospital who does have a very favorable payer mix and is budgeting at 62% commercial this year, uh, which is on par with uh, their past years going back to 2019's actuals at 59 percent they are forecasting a reduction in medicaid and a slight reduction in medicare <clears throat> and npr is a percentage of gross revenues their reimbursement rate is being shown to decline which most likely would run in, in uh, sync with a higher commercial rate base as they negotiate those contracts Recommendations for the hospital. Their 5.7% request is above the ceiling set forth by the board. Um, there was a lot of discussion in their presentation about uh, anticipated volume increases combined with favorable payer mixes, which should allow them to maintain a 5.7% MPR FBP growth, despite the fact that we are requesting a reduction uh, in their change in charge. And that reduction comes from, and, and their commercial effective rate. And that comes from, again, the provider tax component that we feel has been overstated uh, substantially. And <clears throat> that, that figure there, um, we could not justify allowing that to pass over to the commercial payers. And so it is almost 1.7% um, reduction. And that's the value of um, around $8 million, I believe it was, um, to reduce that by. Uh, we do think that their overall change in charges Averaging at 1.1% are low, and um, eventually that is going to have to take up. And again, the effective rate at 6.28%, uh, they would have the ability to go back and negotiate with their commercial payers to improve their margin on their commercial business. So we would expect them to reduce their expenses accordingly. Again, they are the uh, highest year-to-year -year growth, budget-to-budget -budget growth at 8.7%. And they did talk a lot about the um, operational improvements that they're making through technology and other means to uh, make the hospital more efficient. And we would like to see some of those begin to come to fruition um, and suppress that expense base a little bit more in the years ahead. So with that, we conclude our recommendations for the medical center and the slide deck in general, and we welcome the board's discussion points. Can I ask a quick question? Um, on slide 123, where you broke out the approved overall, submitted overall, approved commercial, and submitted commercial for UVM, I'm just wondering why you didn't do that for Porter and CVMC. That might be a helpful comparison over time, and whether you could. Lori, I need some uh, historical context here. You're I don't think you're wrong, Jess. I think we should. Oh, your call um, has been. Basically, we eight, thought because. Zero, two, eight, two, nine, one, six, zero, six is not available. At the tone, please. Rec Could whoever's um, not muted that uh, some someone is somehow trying to dial. If you could mute yourself so that everyone could hear. Thank you. Go ahead, Lori. Hi, Jess, we can submit that for uh, Porter and Central Vermont, but UVM was the one who was doing it the earliest, and we thought that would be uh, more advantageous for you, but we will get that information for Central Vermont and Porter for you. That's wonderful. Thank you very much. Yeah, just a, a couple comments. First on this slide, um, I think it's good to ground um, on those bottom two lines, which is in, you know, 16, they submitted six, they got six, and 17, three, 2.5, and 18, they submitted 0.7 and got 0.7. 
19, we did make a cut from 4 to 2.5, and 20, a modest cut from 4 to 3.5. Because we've we've heard a lot about the requirements needed and, and maybe the cuts that the board has imposed, but um, they've been fairly modest. And to continue on that, if you go to the prior slide, which talks about um, where the operating profit has been, operating margin, um, you know, just to kind of ground ourselves, you know, taking this chart um, in 2015, their operating, well, first of all, you can see the um, actual to budget um, was significantly over an NPR from 15, 16, 17, 18, um, and 19. And when you look at the margin, um, in 2015, the 6.3, 75.6, um, their budget was 44 million. So they were over by $31 million. In 2016, the budget was $46.1 million for operating margin, and they came in at 74, so they were over by 28 million. In 2017, they had a budget of 47.9 million, and they came in at 68.6, so they were 20.7 million over. In 2018, um, again, with only a 0.7% increase in commercial, their budget was 50.4 million. They came in at 46.1, so they were under by 4.3. I would point out in total operating margin, that was more than made up, um, and they exceeded their budget, but keeping to the same numbers, I won't bring that in right now. And in 2019, they had a budget of 39.2, and they came in at 31.4. Uh, I'm not going to bring 2020 in right now because that um, obviously is hugely impacted with COVID. But um, in those five years, for operating margin, the total increase was $67.7 million over. Uh, that is why um, they had a 0.7% increase in 2018 to try to give back some of that. Um, some of that overage and um, in 2000 and, and also we know the 21 million dollars that was allocated for the mental health um, you know which was another decision that we made was really relating to all these overages and even if you take the 67.7 million that they were over in those five years and adjust for the 21 million dollars that they were to pay back they're still 46 million dollars over and I, I just want to put that out there because that's why they had strong cash positions and, and there were some benefits from that. Um, and, you know, really kind of set the stage for the fact that, you know, what we've done in the past um, has been a result of some of the prior year performances. So I just wanted to make sure as a board, you know, we're kind of all aware of what the budgets had been for margin and what the actuals were. And a lot of that does stem from the fact that they exceeded on the NPR quite significantly and it did fall to the bottom line. So um, I know that in 2020, clearly um, there's a huge miss and they didn't get all of the funding that some of the other hospitals did. And you know that needs to be factored in, um, but just, just wanted to make sure everybody kind of understood you know, from this chart the profitability of where things were and why there was some adjustments made uh, to those numbers. And I just want to point out that this was a hospital that um, was failing to meet its operating margin prior to COVID due to uh, two main factors, really. Um, the problems at the Fannie Allen Surgery Center and the implementation of EPIC. And just like every other hospital that is rolled out a new um, health records program. Um, it created some drag on efficiencies and productivity. So um, that should be kept in mind too, that hopefully um, these problems are events that won't reoccur, especially the surgery center. I, I do did see um, the most recent press article that um, talked about the uh, possibility of overuse of cleaning supplies. Um, but certainly, uh, you know, that's a situation that has to be rectified and it can't keep reoccurring, so. And, and I also think this this could, could be a hospital when we discuss, 
where we go that um, you know some of some of the commercial rate change could be related to COVID for the lost revenue, both top line and bottom line that is occurring in 20. Um, you know, that was part of, of how we could justify COVID. It's not just incremental costs and expenses in 21. It's also, you know, what did you lose here? So, so, you know, I would also propose we may have some flexibility to put some in as a COVID, again, which we could then revisit at the end of next year or even middle of next year to determine if that should be kept as permanent or adjusted. I just want to add a little bit to uh, Maureen's kind of macro um, <clears throat> you know, overview. And you know, these are numbers yeah. that, um, yeah, I've cited before, but I think it's worth citing them again. That uh, in terms of um, the operating margin results for 2015 to 2019, uh, the medical center captured 295.8 million, or 89.9 percent of the total net positive operating margin across all uh, 14 hospitals. In terms of uh, the proposal for 2021. Um, of the the total ask is uh, eighty nine point eight million dollars with UVM Medical Center requesting seventy six point eight or eighty five point six percent of all the increase um, in the NPR, leaving only fourteen point four percent to the remaining thirteen hospitals. And just kind of looking at the payer mix information, um, you can see that uh, the medical center's commercial growth rates. Are, are strong. Um, 2020 budget over 2019 was a growth rate from $757 million to $804 million, or 6.2%. And from uh, 2020 budget to 2021 20, uh, request, growing from $804 million to $869.8 million, or an 8.2% growth rate, which um, <clears throat> is I mean, this is all significant because the UVM Medical Center um, is the is 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 so large, and so even small changes, um, uh, you know, affect the, the 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 kind of allocation of total resources across um, across the entire system. And uh, so I worry about that. I, I I fully appreciate the charts that the network sent in terms of. Uh, expenses growing um, at a faster rate than revenues, but um, expenses are also grow, growing and, and, and like trying to close that on the revenue side, but expenses are also growing uh, uh, hugely differentially from what's happening to Vermont uh, citizens and ratepayers and taxpayers and, and, and those folks who are living in a much different world than the kind of rates that we're seeing here for the medical center. So. Um, you know, this is an issue of kind of steering uh, so that in the long term, we just don't have one entity kind of absorbing all the oxygen in the room and uh, some of the others, you know, struggling and falling by the wayside. Before I turn it over to the public for comments on today's uh, presentation, um, is there any further questions or comments from the board on any one of the uh, um Entities that we've discussed today. Um, I I on process, um, as we're, you know, waiting to get information from Mike Smith, which we think we won't get until next week, um, and we do have a meeting scheduled for Friday. Um, there are several hospitals that aren't asking for anything from um, from that money at this point. Um, you know, is that something maybe on Friday we should look at trying to move those forward or does the board want to wait? I'm just throwing out because we can't talk about it privately. Um, you know, or do we want to wait until next week um, to do all of that? Because I think personally we could, could go ahead on some of the hospitals that have not requested any funding, um, but or maybe conditionally approve them until then. So, um I was going to save this until after the public comment on what we've heard so far today, but um, I was actually going to suggest, Maureen, that we cancel Friday. Um, I just think that um, 
now more than ever, we need to be looking at the system as a whole. And I think it would be nice to have all the information in front of us before we start uh, making decisions on, on any hospital. And I think that there's sufficient time next week, especially if we do consider um, extending the date past the 15th, that would allow us um, to have that better conversation. And quite frankly, I don't think it's going to take very long on on some of the low hanging fruit. And so um, unless there's an objection from board member, I would propose that we cancel Friday's board meeting. I respect that as well. I mean, I'm, I'm okay with that. I just wanted to, you know, either either we can't do anything on Friday if we're going to wait or we could move with those. So I, I think that makes sense. So I, I support that decision as well. I just want to throw out what we're going to do. So thanks, Kevin. Is there anyone who objects to canceling Friday's meeting? Not here. Nope. So hearing none, that will be one item we'll take off the table. We will cancel Friday's um, board meeting. Um, so uh, any questions from any board member about uh, any of the uh, presentation today before I open it up to the public? Yeah, Kevin, I have I have one. Um, I spent a little time uh, while going through these hospital budgets, also uh, putting together what I would think might be a rough draft of a standard, uh, some standard language having to do with the cost shift. And uh, I just want to make sure that, uh, you know, that we don't whistle past the graveyard um, on the cost shift, having listened to so many uh, hospitals, um, uh, you know, profile its de deleterious effect, you know, on them. And so I sent what I drafted to uh, Abigail and would um, ask her to, you know, uh, as more of a concept paper, but also something that can be boiled down to, to language um, to uh, take a look at it and see what, see what they think, as well as any member of the public, you know, who wants a copy of it. It's, uh, um, it's just a, uh, you know, I, 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 you know I, I, th I think that, you know, we can't be benignly neglectful of trying to push the envelope to fix the cost shift because it's such a structural imperfection in our system. And um, so I'm just, you know, wrote something up uh, in that regard, asking the board to consider it um, as part of a standard um, uh, um, um, element of, of, of each of the decisions that we render fully consistent with 18 VSA 9456. The language that I'm using or the, the structure of it is fully consistent in my mind you know, with what we, the statutory authorities that we already have, uh, we just got to, you, you know, leverage them and utilize them better. So, Tom, I haven't seen uh, your language, but uh, is it something that you're suggesting that uh, gets posted to the website for public comment on before you introduce it? Or, okay, somebody's putting it up now. Did you yeah. wish to walk us through that now, or what is your intent? Well, uh, I, you know, I prefer um, people spend some time reading it um, and that we, you know, not get into word crafting at this point in time, you know, um, if people kind of are generally favorable, but, uh, you know, want, want to uh, kind of approach it. Um, so I, I, I just prefer to put it on the table, have people read it, and uh, the next time we get together, you know, have, have a thorough discussion of it, but not, not today because it's, it's just too fresh. Okay, thank you, Tom, and I appreciate uh, your getting that out uh, so that people would have a chance to look at it. So um, I'll suggest that Abigail send it around to uh, all the board members and make sure it's posted prominently on the website so that everyone um, will have a chance to take a look at it. And uh, rather than offer uh, suggestions to Tom off the cuff, we can uh, give it some more thoughtful review. Thank you. Is there anyone else from the board with a question or comment? Um, yeah, I think um, in light of the fact that we're not going to have a meeting Friday and that Monday we are going to hear from Mike Smith at some point, and right now our deadline is Tuesday the 15th, I think in, you know, uh, although maybe we'll be able to make that, I think it would probably be more prudent to 
um, put a motion forward to extend the date and give us the flexibility and also kind of that alerts the public right now and maybe put a meeting on for you know the 16th for the whole day or whatever so that we have time at least that the, you know on the 16th if not we can add more time as well but I just think it makes sense to do that now rather than to pull that on the 14th and say we're going to move our date one day before that that soundbite doesn't really hold well and maybe we'll be able to finish everything on the 14th. Yes, it, okay. It's a very good point and I think that uh, member Lunge was um, going to make a motion later in the meeting but maybe it might be appropriate just to get it over with now so Perfect. Robin. Sure uh, hold on just one second because I have it in my email, but I hadn't pulled it up yet. Um, okay, so my um, so my motion is to uh, pursuant to the authority granted in Act ninety one of twenty twenty, I move to extend the deadline for hot for twenty twenty one hospital budget decisions to the close of business September 25th with written orders following within two weeks of the date the board votes on the last hospital. Um, and I chose the 25th because I am hopeful too that we will finish it next week. But if it did have to run into the following week, I didn't want to have to do this twice. So that's why I picked the 25th. Um, just as explanation. And the other piece I would just make as explanation is that I think moving the deadlines will allow us uh, to Maureen's point to move forward with a more orderly regulatory process. And given that we will not have uh, significant funding information related to 2019 until next week, um, extending the deadline will allow us to consider that without uh, issuing orders and then revisiting them. Is there a second? Thank you. And, and uh, thank you, Robin, for offering that motion. I would just say that um, it's the, the chair's intent to try to finish this by Thursday morning of next week. Um, but I um, very much appreciate uh, your motion because it does allow for that uh, uncertainty if we do not finish it by that. Um, but I, I see no reason why we shouldn't be able to meet uh, next Thursday. But again, I think yours is a, is a, a better motion um, because it does allow that flexibility. It also allows the flexibility for the um, writing of the decisions, realizing that um, our staff is going to have to write decisions and that it can't be done overnight for 14 different hospitals, um, but that they are well on their way to um, getting um, the templates crafted. And um, I believe firmly that um, we can get this job done by next Thursday and just be uh, either on time or a day or two late on the written decisions. So with that, is there um, further discussion on this motion? The only thing I would add is I, I totally agree. I am hopeful that we will finish by the 17th, but that assumes that we do actually get the AHS information on Monday. So, you know, if for some reason there's further delay there, that's, Kind of what I had in the back of my mind. Yep. Further discussion? If not, all those in favor of the motion signify Kevin. by saying aye. Kevin, yes. Hold on. Uh, you probably want to take public comment on that. That motion is my suggestion. Thank you, Mike. That makes a lot of sense. So at this point, um, I'm going to open it up for public comment just on this motion, and then after this motion. Um, is voted on. We'll open it up to public comment on all the slides presented today. So uh, public comment on this motion only. Hello, Kevin. This is Mark Stanislaus from the University of Vermont Health Network. Um, I would also think to add to this, and this will come up under the other public comment perspective, but this also gives a little bit more time I think the staff had made some calculations that they have factored into the recommendation. And this also gives a little bit more time, well, to work through those components. Uh, um, you know, well, 
you know, I think we would all like to get it done by the 15th. I think it's more important to go about it a little bit more cautiously. And there's so many more variables this year than ever before that are outside of the hospital's controls and the board's control too. So, so I just wanted to put that out there. So um, I think the extension makes definite sense. Thank you, Mark. And we're definitely uh, hoping that you'll weigh in to, to uh, confirm whether the staff is accurate or not on the um, provider tax issue. So other uh, public comment on the motion before us, which is to extend the deadline. If not, all those in favor of the question signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, motion carries. So with that, I'm going to open it up to public comment on all the uh, presentation that has occurred um, today. And uh, the first person I will recognize is Mike Del Treco. Mike. Yeah, good morning, Chair Mullen, or good afternoon. Oh, it's still morning. Uh, so uh, <laughs> first of all, thanks uh, to you and your team uh, board members and, and the uh, GMCB hospital uh, team uh, for really thorough presentations and, and thoughtful consideration here. Um, in the same vein of trying to understand all of the inputs and variables in a very fluid time, um, I'm not sure if your uh, hospital team or, or the board is aware of several uh, moving parts around three, 340B um, reimbursement. As we know, um, as you know, 340B or other operating revenues is so vitally important to the profitability of our institutions. Uh, there's some pretty significant changes uh, that are um, being uh, tossed about. Um, a couple of them are things like Eli Lilly uh, and AstraZeneca not uh, shipping 340B drugs to hospitals. Um, that's sort of a industry decision. It's and it's um, against the, it's probably violating the law on how the 340B activity is supposed to take place. Um, there's proposed 30% reimbursement or or changes in payment um, cuts that are that are out there um, in the outpatient perspective payment rule. So in this um, vein of trying to get everything um, right, that's fluid. Maybe part of the questions. Um, when you go, when your teams go out to ask hospitals, could include impact of 340B um, changes that are on the horizon. Mike, is that something that Vaz could um, submit as uh, um, testimony, since it seems to impact all the hospitals? Is it something that you could submit a summation of uh, what is transpiring? Um, I'm sure we. I'm sure we can certainly pull that together. There's some. There are some uh, issues that will affect all hospitals, and then the others uh, around outpatient proposed rules that don't impact critical access. So there's a little bit of a, a juggling act here, but we can um, we can pull something together and get you that. Okay, great. Do you know what type of type of timeline you could get that to us in? Well, uh, where we're, we're where we're shooting to have everything you're shooting to have everything done. Uh, next week, um, what's today, Wednesday, we can put a request out and see what we can uh, uh, pull together in that same time frame. Yeah, um, I would suggest that you try to get it to us by Monday. If sure. If possible. Sure. Great. I appreciate that, Mike, and, and appreciate uh, the uh, useful, if not uh, um, cheery information. And um, Mike, do you know if AHA is um, planning any type of uh, class action lawsuit to try to uh, uh, prohibit those two companies from uh, violating the law? I do know that AHA is um, having a meeting, I think, believe it's today or this afternoon, uh, more specifically to discuss how they might uh, proceed, proceed in this area. Um, so as we learn more, we can certainly include that in our uh, information back to you. Thank you so much, Mike. Always appreciate it. Yep, thank you. Other public comment?
Hi, Kevin. This is Mark. Um, I'm going to try to segregate my public comment into each one of the UVM Health Network affiliate hospitals. Um, the first thing I would just say is, you know, just as a general, general comment, um, you know, the numbers that might just, you know, referenced on the 340B potential changes that are out there, or, you know, um, I think those changes just came available to us last week, and the numbers are not insignificant. Um, and at this time, you know, it is very hard to estimate them because the information is just, you know, so, so fresh. And the other thing that I would set, like to say as it relates to 340B, and I think this relates to all of the hospitals, obviously it has impacted some differently than others, but, you know, part of the reason that has allowed commercial rates to be lower, I believe, is because of the growth we've been able to secure as a hospital system through other revenue, okay? So, you know, I don't want to lose sight of that. And, and, and that has also been part of the revenue that has been covering the difference between the expense trend and NPR. Um, so, so, you know, I don't want to lose sight of it. And it also appears that that window is very quickly closing on all of the hospitals too. Um, so, you know, I wanted to throw that thought out there. The other thing I wanted to say, at least for all of the health network hospitals, is that, and it was so difficult to pick what your basis was for the budgets, but the basis for the budgets, I just wanted to remind everyone, like we said during our presentation, um, it was, it was, they were built without any impact of COVID in there because we just didn't know how else to do it. So, so you know, if, if we talk about a COVID, non-COVID portion, COVID portion. Is, is, is the piece, of, piece it. of it. I'm getting feedback on my end. Yeah, if I could yeah, ask, I everyone, could ask everyone, everyone to mute themselves, themselves unless, unless they are unless speaking. They're speaking. Okay, so... I just wanted to remind everybody of that. And, and, and you know, I also wanted to say that the cost shift is impacting the hospitals. You know, you can discuss, there's different opinions on how much or how you go about calculating it, but the cost shift is real, okay? And if we don't find a way to offset a large portion of it, that means that is born on the backs of the providers. So, you know, I just want to get that comment out there. I mean, it seems kind of odd. You know, I want to make sure that the default isn't that it's born on the backs of the providers, because these are the individuals, whether they're individual, um, you, you know, whether they're physician practices, hospitals or not, you know, they are the ones that the community members rely on when they show up at that door to provide the care. So, and obviously this is a balancing act and, is a juggling act and there's a lot of moving pieces um, and there's no perfect answer. So, you know, I did want to put that out there. Um, and, and, and then the other thing, well, I don't think it's that important because the focus wasn't that great on that, but I just want to remind when we talk about payer mix, payer mix is really the split of gross revenue, not of net revenue. And what was shown today was net revenue. So, so, so you know, I, I mean, well, to me, that's almost net payment mix, not what the payer mix, because the payer mix of the volume of the services that you are providing are completely different than what that net is. And I've said this before, and it's it it's difficult to look at either one in isolation, and it's a complicated conversation. Well, to put all the pieces well together, but I did want to share that. So so. I'm going to attempt to fill in for Jen Bertrand, if that's possible, as it relates to Porter. Okay. <laughs> um, um, so Porter being a critical access hospital, understanding with the relationship of expense and the cost to charge ratio is a very, very important relationship um, as we think about any of these potential changes that were put out there. It's not just as simple as, say, changing the expenses to make things balance because that changes the whole reimbursement model. So, you know, I would stress that there needs to be some work done to understand the relationship of that before a final decision is made, you know, so there's no unintended consequences. Um, the other thing that I would like to throw out there too, 
as it relates to Porter and all hospitals, um, there is still the staffing challenge in healthcare. The wages need to be competitive to attract people. If not, you fall back on, on travelers and premium revenues. And I also think with that Porter is going through a contract negotiation because there was something said about their increase. So I just wanted to put that out there. And, 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 and I think across the state of Vermont, I think we realized how important these frontline workers are in circumstances like this. So I just wanted to put that out there also. And then the last thing is, is, you know, the relationship between the nursing home and the hospital, okay? This goes back to way, way back when, and I can't say, you know, when that win was, but when the nursing home was stood up and the hospital was stood up, they're under different tax identification numbers. So, well, so that's why they're split out that way. And it's, and and it's it is it is complicated and also i all, i also think it's precedent setting if it's broken out in this budget cycle compared to the other ones but there's also other relationships and there is one that jen wanted me to say that um jen estimates having the skilled nursing facility that close or on their campus saves the hospital about a million dollars a year okay because on the swing beds, they can transfer them to the skilled nursing hospital if the patient qualifies. And the change in payment rate is about twelve to fifteen hundred dollars um, per day. So 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 having that there while they're showing as a loss there, it probably does reduce the total cost of care that we don't want to lose sight of. And there's other reasons for this based upon the relationship of how a critical access hospital is structured and the reimbursement model with Medicare. So I just wanted to put those out there and potentially, you know, we may work with staff on some of those educational items if it helps. Um, as it relates to CVMC, um, it would be great to work with the staff on that provider tax calculation because our number isn't quite as high as the one that they referenced. I think they referenced around $2 million. Um, and, you know, our calculations on the low end is a half a million, on the high end, it's a million. And it seemed that there was a lot of emphasis on what that number was to do a backwards calculation. So it would be great to have the opportunity, well, to work with the staff on that. And as far as it relates to the University of Vermont Medical Center, I would say the exact same thing. Well, to just work with the staff on their provider tax calculation, because we do think as it's budgeted is in line with prior year relationships at the end of the actual year. If you look at the total, well, compared to the total NPR, but you know we're very glad to go into those conversations with an open mind. And then the other thing I do just have to put out there about the medical centers or performance as it relates to 15 or years FY15 to, through 17. That is in line with what we presented for our CON presentation for the Miller Building. We had said that our margin performance would increase. We were building cash going into a major investment. And so I just don't want that to get lost. Um, at the same time, I do think the right focus is FY 2019, you know, performance, but I don't want to lose sight of that. That was in line with all of our multi-year financial framework projections that we put forward during the Miller building CON. So, you know, and, and, and then I know it is very hard to juggle these two, but, you know, adjusting adjusting commercial rates for a one year impact for something that continues in perpetuity that's a difficult thing to balance particularly over multiple years and you know i think that's kind of where we are as a health system is you know i think that balance for a single year decision has made sense but when you look at the impact over multiple years that has led a little bit to the deterioration of the total hospital system you know margin and i would welcome the opportunity on how we could think about this differently so you know thank you for your time um um and you know if there's anything else well, that we can help you with you know we look forward to working with any of the board members or the staff 
Thank you, Mark. And we're definitely going to take you up on that opportunity. If uh, Patrick and his team could work with you and your team to try to, to uh, get the exact uh, correct numbers on the uh, provider tax, it would be very helpful. So thank you for that and, and uh, appreciate your comments. Um, is there other public comments? Other public comment? Can you, this, Kevin, this is Ham. Can you hear me? We can, Ham. Proceed. Yes, I, I wonder if I, uh, uh, Kevin, I wonder if you could would ask uh, Patrick whether the recommendation on Northwest um, effectively um, approved or disapproved of either or both of the uh, uh, new uh, uh, much reinforced ICU as well as a sleep specialist. That was a, those were big issues in the spring, and I can't tell whether the what what I didn't I, I can't tell the way that the staff proposed to dispose of them. So Patrick Ham's question evolves around um, both the expansion of the ICU and the um, um, sleep um, therapy practice. Um, do you have an answer for him, or do you need to get back to him? I would defer to Lori on that one. We just, we, in our recommendation, we said we would ask the board to acknowledge those enhanced services as they are not necessarily provider transfers. They're just explanations of why their NPR is increasing. I, I don't know what that means, Kevin. So what it means is um, it, it's not uh, uh, tacitly approving or denying, but it's factored into their recommendations. Okay, thank you. Okay. Other public comment? Can I ask a question? Yes, go ahead. I believe that's Dale. Is that you, Dale? Yeah, it is. I've only been able to pop in and out a little bit, so I'm kind of sketchy on following it, but doing my best. Um, Robin mentioned that we don't have to, uh, that you would not have to revisit it by the proposal. Are you thinking that when you pass these hospital budgets, you won't have to revisit them for a whole year? Because I, would I don't think, I don't think that, uh, at least I didn't hear Robin say that. No. So what I said, this is Robin, what I said was that um, that was specific to the time extension for the deadline of September 15th that's in statute. Uh, because we are getting the AHS information on Monday, it allows us more time to factor it in and not have us make decisions and then get that information right afterwards. So that was only related to the, the motion um, about extending the time. Okay, that's what I wanted to clarify because I, where there's so much dynamic going on, um, I, I would be hesitant to say that you aren't going to have to revisit this within the next year. I think there's going to be continued discussions on a regular basis. Okay, thank you. Other public comment? If not, Patrick, Lori, Caitlin, we really want to thank you um, for all the information you've put together for us. Um, you have a few homework assignments, and um, hopefully by canceling Friday's meeting, it gives you a little bit more time to um, try to assimilate the, the uh, data requests that have been given you. Um, but the board is very, very appreciative of all the hard work that your team has put in, and um, thank you. Um, board members, um, we have the minutes of Wednesday, September 2nd. Would someone like to make a motion? So moved. Second. It's been moved and seconded to approve the minutes of Wednesday, September 2nd, without any additions, deletions, or corrections. Is there any discussion? 
Hearing none, all those in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? So at this time, I am going to um, recess this meeting till one o'clock where the topic will not be hospital budget. So we will not need the uh, court reporter this afternoon, but thank you very much, Sonny, for this morning. Um, there's a lot of uh, numbers and everything thrown out very quickly, and I'm always amazed at how you're able to capture everything and get it so correct. So th thank you for this morning. Um, board members, we will reconvene at one o'clock this afternoon.